I'm currently the, uh, an associate professor and department head of uh, political science here at Kansas State University. Um, I grew up in Colorado. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force, and so we moved around a fair bit when I was a kid. But then that was that was where we settled. I graduated from high school in Colorado Springs. Um, I did my undergrad degree. I started out in political science at uh, University of Colorado. But frankly, I didn't really like it very much. Um, and I wound up actually really heavily considering going to be a physical therapist instead. Uh, but then I took a class. Um, it was black politics, but he taught it from a perspective of political science as a science, right? Okay, we have these theories, we have hypotheses from these theories, then we test them with data. And that opened up a new world for me. Um, and that all of a sudden, I, I fell in love with political science as well. I did an undergraduate research project um, that and then my uh, undergraduate advisor, his name is Eric Yankee, he's now at Michigan State. Um, he said, yeah, like, you, you, if you want to go to grad school, I'll, I'll write you a letter. And I'd never consider that in my life. Um, but I, I did, I applied. And uh, went to Indiana, got my PhD in Indiana, um, was really lucky to be there. Um, I had great faculty mentoring. Um, the American politics group, uh, particularly then, was really, really, really strong. And so I had a great relationship with people who were doing stuff on representation, like Jerry Wright, but then people who were doing Congress stuff, with, like uh, Bill Bianco, but then also kind of just broader participation with like Margie Hershey. And so all of those together really kind of helped to form my research interests. Uh, which is fundamentally about the relationship between representatives and broadly defined and, and the constituents. Um, and then so then, yeah, I graduated from Indiana in 2012, and I've been here here at K-State ever since. Excellent. And so I guess, you know, the work that you've done, broadly speaking, has been a lot of constituent related work, probably stemming from some of that work you did in your graduate degree. Can you talk through what areas really drew you in and why? Yeah, I think that one of the big things I was I started being interested in um, was kind of an offshoot of some of my advisor's work, which is kind of the way graduate school tends to work. Um, and it was about uh, when, when, a, when a member of Congress is too conservative or too, or too liberal for their district, do they get punished for that? And there's pretty robust evidence that that took place at, at the national level. But then at, at the state legislative level, it was a little bit more unclear. And so that was my first that was what my dissertation was about. That's what my first uh, one of my first articles was about. Was looking at the relationship between uh, state legislators and the constituent preferences. And do, if a constituency is say fifty five percent Democratic, but then you have a really really liberal legislator, do, does that liberal legislator get punished in favor of a more moderate legislator? Um, and what I found is that there were some modest uh, sanctions, not enough to overwhelm uh, a lot of races, but there was enough, right, to show the electorate is kind of paying attention. The electorate does actually have the capacity to sanction legislators. Um, and from there, I continued just to be interested in the relationship between, again, this constituents and and their and their elected officials, whether it's in uh, sort of the the, the way that. Uh, constituents tend to be kind of animated to act to activity um and if they're going to be kind of extreme um to like even just the way that it goes now to i've got a new project looking at the relationship between uh policymakers and support for repeals versus support for new enactments and so there's always been that kind of keeping in mind both right both the constituency and also the policymakers and trying to kind of make sure that those linkages are are assessed interesting so why don't we go into this notion of uh constituents and their and their representatives, right? So can you kind of outline, I guess, the, the specific questions that you had about this relationship and then the research you did and what you found from that? Yeah, so I, again, I think that the, the big question was, do legislators, uh, do, do their actions really matter to the district, right? And so like, do, does it matter if you are really out of touch or uh, or if you really write, write in step? And, and do the constituents pay enough attention to punish you if you are way out of step? And the idea, of course, is that like if you have a very liberal district, you should have a liberal representative. If you have a moderate district, you should have a moderate representative. If you have a conservative district, you have a conservative representative. But one of the questions really is, again, are, do we know? Um, it's very hard uh, as a constituent to understand what's going on in the state house. It's very hard to understand all the policies that are coming around, uh, all the uh, the way that your member is voting. Um, those are those are relatively opaque. Um, at Congress, it's sort of okay, right? We know how senators are voting, right? It's relatively easy for us to keep track of them. But at the state legislative level, where you can have anywhere from 80 to 400 uh, state legislators in a state, in a given, say, one or two media markets, that is a lot more complicated, it's a lot more fraught. Um, and so some of my work was actually finding that despite all of these disadvantages, despite the fact that, you know, you know, Topeka News can only report on so many things that are happening in the state legislature. Most districts do find uh, 
some responsiveness. They do find that more conservative districts will punish somebody for being too liberal, right? More liberal districts will punish somebody for being conservative. Um, and so that, um, that, that's really kind of one of the, an, one of the animating things that, that for me, uh, especially earlier on. Um, so later work has come in and said that like this really related to the media market size. Um, so the number of local newspapers who are covering state legislators can kind of weaken that relationship. So as like we've, we've seen the decline of local news, that tends to be bad. That tends to make it so that we then there is no sanction, right? That the legislators are relatively free to, to do what they want uh, without any penalty by, from the voting box. Um, and so that kind of speaks to, that's not my work, that's Steve Rogers's work, uh, but it, it does speak to the, the really important role of the media as an intermediary um, to help facilitate that representative relationship. And so when you say sanction, you mean not voting for them in the next election or what do you mean? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah. So, yeah, not voting for them in the election, voting for an opponent instead. Um, and so um, there are other ways of assessing sanctions, like, say, for withholding uh, campaign contributions, uh, you know, uh, protesting, right, Letter, all, all kinds of other things. Uh, but I was looking specifically at the election at the, at the ballot box. And when you say in the ballot box, we're talking about the general election or we're talking about the primary election or both? I was looking at the general election, um, which is, uh, we, I did some, uh, some other work, I never found a home for it, but it was actually looking at primary elections as well, um, where you do see kind of the same kind of dynamic occur at the primary, uh, at the, uh, inside the primary, right? So then if you do have a very conservative Republican versus a more mi mainstream Republican, and if the district is very conservative, the more conservative one will win because he's kind of right over that, or they are right over kind of the district preferences. And so then, uh, and so what that can lead to are very liberal and very conservative elected officials uh, winning the primaries. And then in the general election, it's the kind of question is who's slightly more moderate uh, and they're more likely to be successful. Yeah, because I think the, I guess the general uh, feeling is that the the primary voters are more radicalized than the, than the typical voter, even within their own party. So wouldn't that, you know, it, it would stand to reason then that the, that the um, more more radicalized candidates would make it to the general election. Yes, that's absolutely right. And so there is some penalty for being a little bit more radical in the general election. But typically, the calculus of the legislator is such that it's worth it, right? Because like it's better to win your primary and then hope that you can animate your base and their general than to uh, than to kind of alienate your party by being mostly electable in the general election. And so that 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 sequencing there, um, also knowing that the the primary voters are typically more attentive. Um, than the general elected voters are, that, that all the incentives are there to go out, right, to the kind of the polls, rather than to come in. Um, the only incentive to come in is in that is in that general election. Um, and there the question is, of course, like, how many people turn out to vote? You know, it's interesting that the concept you mentioned about information earlier in the local media. So does this apply to legislators based in their in their own, you know, in their own states? Or does it also apply to the, you know, to the representatives in the U.S.? Congress, you know, so for instance, if there's only one local newspaper uh, versus 10 that are very robust, right, um, does that impact both the local level and the national level elections, you know, and how informed they are and how close they bring the the members to their preferences? Yeah, really good question. And and yes, the, 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 this one does kind of scale, right? The idea that if you have a robust um, media network at uh, sort of at the state level, that helps to kind of make sure that the relationships between legislators and constituents are pretty strong. That same finding holds when we look at, at Congress, right? That if you have, it, it, it's harder in California, say, when you have so many assembly members, or I'm sorry, um, House members in the state, it's hard to still kind of describe all of them, right? You know, LA has, 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 has LA County has a bigger population than most states. Um, but then here in Kansas, for example, and most other states, not the, not the super populous ones, it, it's actually relatively straightforward to pull up, you know, how your members voted, right? So in Colorado, um, you know, it's it, relatively easy both to pull, like, say, like Jonah Goose and also Lauren Boebert and identify them and report on them in the same story. Um, here in Kansas, we've got four, so that's relatively straightforward. So what kind of reporting do you think is relevant, right? So you could just like list the votes, right, in the newspaper, or you could have an article that says, you know, this person voted in a great way according to the, you know, according to the journalist or in a bad way according to the journalist or, you know, how are these things framed and does the framing matter for the local decision makers, you know, the voters? Yeah, good question. Um, so I've not looked at this specifically, but other some other work um, tends to tends to tends to kind of show that you know the, the editorializing 
it tends not to have the same effect that just kind of the, the more straightforward uh, sort of aspect, right? Presenting a policy and showing how your member, like describing the sort of the context of the bill um, and then describing how your members voted, um, that tends to be pretty effective. Um, but then once we kind of start to, media is always going to be accused of bias, um, no matter sort of which direction they're going. Um, and so the, the sort of the more straightforward approach tends to be the most resistant to that kind of allegation of bias. Once we kind of have say this is, you know, this is out of step with the member's district, that's one thing. But then to say like this is a bad vote is something that most practices would, would, would recommend against. Um, but people seem to, there's not a lot of people who know a ton about what's going on in Congress or in the state legislatures, but there are enough that uh, when information signals do come through, they actually do tend to do tend to carry the day, right? There's enough people who kind of move in a systematic direction, um, especially on things that are, that are uh, you know, salient issues, right? Say abortion or gay marriage or, um, you know, funding for public schools, right? Those things people tend to understand and they do tend to feel uh, pretty strongly about them. And so as a consequence, when when news comes out that they voted the wrong way, um, that will that, that will hurt the, the legislator. And so do you have you done any work on how the legislator responds to that, right? Whether they move uh, when they, I guess it's maybe too late when they have the, uh, when they have the election, but, you know, is there, is there a two-way communication here? Is it, you know, is is a weak local media? How, how does that play into the calculus of the little of the legislator? I guess is my question. Yeah, I think that um, well, I, kind of two different reactions. Like one is, of course, that as a legislator, you can always claim credit for something that you voted against. Right, we're seeing a lot of this right now. Um, uh, both senators from Florida uh, were talking about how how good it is that they're protecting the swamp, even though they both voted against that same policy. Uh, we're seeing the same thing now with the uh, the broadband uh, with uh, Biden's pr proposal to to broaden uh, widen broadband access. Um, legislators voted against it, but then are still uh, uh, sort of talking about it as well, hoping that we kind of don't keep track. Um, but then the other kind of the reaction that I have as well is the um, that yeah, if when, when we have weak uh, media outlets, when we have a sort of low level of, of kind of, of, of the ability to spread the message, um, that does allow legislators to to vote the wrong way and to still claim credit for an outcome that people would, would find uh, sort of appropriate. And so the, and they can kind of do so without risk. Um, maybe it will come up when they are running for general election again and their opponent will bring this up. Uh, but there's a lot of races that are uncontested, um, even in districts that that should, that, you know, if you look at it, should have uh, sort of an out party running against you. Um, you know, a third of, of state legislative districts are simply just are, go uncontested each year. And so that does mean that, uh, again, right, we kind of look for, for reasons that we may kind of sanction somebody, we may vote against somebody. Well, you're running unopposed, then, then, then there's not much we can do about it. Right. So let's talk about the local media that matters. So, you, you know, you mentioned the local media and how many there are. You mean newspapers versus social media versus their own party apparatus or the opponent's party apparatus. You're talking specifically newspapers or 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 uh, or news channels on television. You know what what is it that you count as local media? Yeah, I count. I'm primarily focusing on uh, dedicated state house reporters, right? So whether it's in the in a, in a newspaper or on the or on TV or radio. Um, what we what we're seeing is a real hollowing out of of those kinds of, of of desks, right? We used to have a whole bunch of a whole bunch of newspapers, and then a whole bunch of newspapers with their own independent reporter at the state house. Um, and now we're seeing a real consolidation there, where it's only maybe a couple um, a couple out, outlets can actually support that desk. Um, and so then the rest of them are just kind of relying on like a newswire, something like from the AP or something else like that. Um, and so that does weaken again, kind of the uh, the information flow about what's going on in. The state house to the constituents. So it's the number of reporters that matters covering that particular uh, member that matters. That, yeah, that's right. It, it really is kind of a density question. Um, if we have a relatively sparse, then it tends to tends to be less effective. If we have multiple reporters from, from multiple outlets, then that tends to really improve the kind of the information environment for for better decision making by constituents. And what's the do you do you have any sense for the quantitative change there? Like you know, it used to be five to one, and now it's two to one, or how does that? Work? That's a good question. I don't. That the, some of the, some of the work by Steve Rogers again would would link to this. I believe that it is. It it has gone from I, I think yeah uh, from at least a, a solid stable of of, of state house reporters, let's say ten, uh, down to like three or four right in, in a given state right, and so we're probably seeing about probably a fifty to sixty percent drop. Um, in the number of state house reporters.
maybe we can add chat gpt4 to the to the list of, uh, of reporters in every district and that would help things out i mean it is going to come that way right like just like how you know all the sort of if you're just looking at like how the stocks have done over the over the day right all that content is just completely auto generated right and so i would not be surprised to see some sort of iteration of that the, the curious thing of course is that like so many of these models are are have stopped being trained after like say 2021 and so then they're kind of being trained on old data and so it'd be interesting to see how they churn things out yeah so anything else on this constituent um, legislator connection that is of interest? You know, you know, I'm I'm very curious about this information flow and and uh, and how it changes behavior or or you know of the voter or it changes behavior of the legislator, right? Yeah. So anything else you can comment on that? Yeah, I think that one of the things that's really interesting is that there's, there's a tremendous uh, resource called DC Inbox. This woman Lindsay Cormack um, has put together all congressional newsletters for. 20 years. Um, it, it's really, it's a tremendous resource and it's freely available. She, she's a real public service to the discipline. Um, but in that you can look for uh, frequency of word use and you can look at the uh, sort of things that are commonly talked about by Republicans or commonly talked about by Democrats or the kind of the ebbs and flows of, of that. And again, it's in real time, which is really nice, right? Because as you know, <coughs> excuse me, building a data set is hard. Keeping a data set updated is a whole different task. And so the fact that she's been able to do this is, is huge. Um, and so one of my, a couple of my co-authors and I were looking at the relationship between uh, the usage of, of the word repeal, um, the kind of the, the rhetoric that occurs. And what we found is that uh, Republicans talk about repeals far more than Democrats do. When Republicans are talking about repeals, they're talking about it with a positive emotional valence, right? They're using words that are like, this is a good thing. Whereas Republic, uh, Democrats, when they talk about repeals, are probably talking about it as a threat, right? The, the Republicans are trying to repeal this. And it's not just the Affordable Care Act. Um, of course, that's going to carry the lion's share of things. But even things like... Um, uh, don't ask, don't tell, or uh, waters of the United States, um, all sort of environmental water policy, all of those things also still, we still find that same uh, sort of uh, trend occurring in elite messaging. Um, and of course, the people who are reading these new newsletters are constituents, um, but they're disproportionately going to be constituents in that member's party. And so they're really kind of sending signals to, to their base. Uh, but one of the interesting consequences of all of this is that there is now a feedback loop where uh, Republican constituents prefer uh, a policy to be uh, sort of achieved through a repeal rather than, than through a sort of a stand seemingly standalone new bill. Um, so much so that now, like the idea of shrinking government, the idea of achieving something by, by having fewer laws on the books rather than more laws on the books, that is so appealing to the rank and file constituent that they will actually now support something. We did a survey experiment where we actually looked at, okay, we're going to achieve this goal, whether it's uh, cut corporate farm subsidies or uh, uh, sort of help reform Congress to be more effective. If it's happening through a repeal, then Republicans like it more, Democrats like it less. If it's happening through a new enactment, then the opposite is true. Uh, Republicans like it less, Democrats like it more. And so we're seeing there's this, there is a cyclical relationship between information coming from elites down to constituents, but then constituents now demanding Sort of more adherence to that same that same kind of rhetorical strategy. So that that's quite interesting. And you know, the word repeal is one you focused on. Are there any other kinds of words or things that that have demonstrated that same kind of cyclical nature? That's a good question. So that was the only thing we looked at in that experiment. Um, but I've got a new project right now, actually looking at uh, the congressional response to uh, mass shootings uh, and what happens after a mass shooting incident occurs in your district. Um, it, you know, do we talk about mental health? Do we talk about firearms? Do we only talk about mental health, which is a common uh, a common uh, theme for, for members who want to respond to a mass shooting? They, they have to say something, but they're opposed to any kind of gun control legislation. How do you, you have to say something, what do you say? You talk about mental health. And so we are seeing um, sort of po things popping up about, uh, they may be talking about legislation, uh, firearms, but like, again, sort of the emotional valence is very, very different. Democrats talk about like common sense gun control laws um, and Republicans, when they talk about it, tend to talk about things from a perspective of uh, protect our Second Amendment rights. Uh, we should not infringe on things. Right. So there's some really kind of key words that really do really split uh, the kind of the way that even if we're talking about the same thing, we're talking about in two very different ways. So maybe you need to invent a new word that encompasses the other two words that's neutral. It's the only way forward. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Um, it, it was a challenge actually for us to, because this this project, is, I don't have good results yet, so otherwise I'd 
share them with you. But one of the challenges of even uh, funding bills that are introduced by members of Congress, mental health is pretty straightforward. They don't tend to, like both Democrats and Republicans still tend to use the word mental health um, in, in most circumstances. But but if you look for, if you if you go to the Library of Congress and the, the, the sort of the bill histories, uh, if you use the word gun control, you're only going to get bills that are introduced by Republicans because they're talking about they're talking about like the Democrats are trying to do gun control. We can't allow that to happen. Um, if you but, so you have to use a more neutral term like firearms, which actually does seem to kind of bridge the two. Um, but as you say, like that that kind of a common dictionary seems to seems to not really be be there, or at least harder to find than you would think. Yeah. So I know with repeals, you've done more different kinds of work. Um, anything else you want to talk about on? Uh... On the constituent legislator communication before we move on to the repeals question. No, let's let's jump right into repeals. So I know that you've uh, looked at repeals as a concept in the in the Congress uh, versus new legislation, uh, or it's at least if it's framed as new legislation. Can you talk through the questions that you had in that regard and what what interesting answers did you find? Yeah, so this is work with uh, Jordan Ragusa at the College of Charleston, and he and I um, were interested in. Uh, how bills come into being in the first place, but then how bills then once once they're in once they're in place, what the what the history is after that. Um, and there's some other really good work um, by people like Eric Patashnik who who say that you know this is only the first step, right? We've created something, and now what's going to happen afterward? Um, and so Jordan and I were coming at this not not necessarily about how things will change from uh, policy development to then implementation by the agencies, although that is also really important. You know, if we're opposed to it. Like we lost on on passing the bill, but maybe we can just cut the funding in two years, right? And so the, those kinds of uh, pathways are there. That wasn't what we explored, though. We simply looked at: Are you going to take now? It's on it, now. It's in the U.S. Code. Are you trying to take it out of the U.S. Code? And um, and so the question really was like: Why does this happen? Why why is it that a policy that is uh, was popular, right, has has now been has now been done away with? And so we're. Of course, like we started actually thinking about this project prior to the passage of the Affordable Care Act, but then after the Affordable Care Act um, uh, became law, of course, then that became it, it became the elephant of the room that we had to be thinking about as well. And the, the 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 thing that we wound up finding is that there are certainly some aspects about, like, say, just bad policy just being on, on being re repealed. Right, a really great example of this is the Chinese Exclusion Act. We had passed the Chinese Exclusion Act as you know, and as uh, anti-immigrant kind of xenophobic uh, attempt to restrict immigration from China um, back in like in the, in the late 19th century. Uh, but then we it was on the books up until World War II when the Japanese uh, were telling our Chinese allies that, uh, hey, look, like you shouldn't really help them out at all because you know they don't even let you in the country. And we kind of realized like, hey, that's probably not a good look. We should change that. And so the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act was a real problem solving approach, right? Like we, we need to get rid of this. We need to show up our allied support over uh, in East Asia. Well, this is a good way to do it. Um, but most other policies that, that do get reversed don't tend to really solve a problem. Um, they tend to actually achieve a partisan goal. Um, so whether it is going back to the days of bimetallism, uh, again, like kind of 1870s, to uh, much more contemporary things like uh, repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That those are really about, at the time, Republicans were strongly against it, Democrats were strongly for it. And so it really was about Democrats being able to achieve a goal, at, even though it, over the opposition of, of Republicans. And so those fights are certainly present, um, but they're not new, right? That goes, again, as far, we collected data as far back as 1870s and found that there are real ebbs and flows to these that really match the ebbs and flows of uh, partisan polarization, partisan bickering, partisan and partisan animosity. So when we talk about repeals versus, I mean, you, you can imagine amendment or a, or a new a new bill that essentially guts or does the same thing as a repeal. I think that's the point you're making, right? Which is you can achieve the same objective in multiple ways through legislation. The note, the notion of a repeal has a rhetorical or a or a a kind of a gotcha um effect that those other ones don't uh up and above the actual policy implications yeah that, that's exactly right there is an element of of we're, like this has been a trophy on the opposite team's wall but we're going to take it down right and rather than again you as as you said there's a lot of other ways uh, of killing a policy uh quietly uh reorganizing things changing the director structure all kinds of other things you can do in the bureaucratic implementation of something but um to to actually fundamentally just take something off the books, it seems to be like um, 
a slightly different goal, right? Because the goal is not just to do it with the policy, but it's, it's to have a public uh, kind of uh, 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 touchstone, right? That you can point to and say, we did this for you against them. I'm curious about, you know, the repeals that have been successful, right? In any given Congress, uh, if you look at the number of lines of code or the number of words that were actually struck from the from the code and compare that to the other bills that have been introduced during that that Congress and whether the repeals actually reduce more code than the others. Uh, that yeah, would be that, a good study. Yeah, that, that is, a, I've not looked at the actual, I don't have a quantitative assessment of this, but just having spent a lot of time looking at a lot of these things, it does not really simplify the, the code whatsoever. Um, and, and because of course, if you strike out, you know, something in this section, but then like the fourth section actually refers to that. Now you have to modify that fourth section as well. And so it doesn't really wind up shortening anything. Um, and oftentimes it makes it more complex because you have, you know, just kind of layers of, of, of policies that kind of speak to one another. Say if you undo this one, then without the entire tower falling, then you have to now kind of remap everything as well. So why do you think, I mean, why? Why Why would they need the, to tear down the opposing uh, party's flag and, and, and bring it over to their house and, if it just achieves the same objective? Is it just purely, is it just petty, right? Or is it just, or is there something more there? Is it is it a, a strategy to keep cohesion in your own party? You know, what what are the, fancy ways to look at this other than we stole something from the output from the from the other side's camp yeah that's a good question uh, the capture the flag analogy is a good one that not really occurred to me but yeah i think that there is an element of this that is ex explicitly position taking for constituents right about um de developing a party brand and maintaining that party brand um and you know because parties have a delicate relationship uh, with how they differentiate themselves from one another in, in, the, in the view of the constituents, because constituents always want bipartisanship, um, not bipartisanship because it does anything, right, but bipartisanship for its own sort of sake. Um, and so we, that, that there is that sense of like, we want you to be bipartisan. But then we also said that like, I elected you to go represent our values, right? And like don't don't give in, right? And so there's this delicate tension that, that exists between working with the other party, then also sticking like kind of poking the other party in the eye. And so I think that um, pursuing a repeal in this sense helps to buttress that, you know, we are this team that we're against the opposing team. Um, what's interesting, of course, is that most legislation is passed by partisan. Right, most legislation is actually passed with both Democratic and Republican votes. And so when we see these elements of, of repeals and, and party leaders really dedicating time in the congressional agenda uh, to talk about this repeal instead of the litany of other things that they could be working on, that it seems to really indicate like a real partisan strategy to, to animate their base, to make sure that they stay supportive and, and behind them, uh, whether it's financially or knocking on doors. Um, all of that seems to be kind of this, this kind of the tightrope between bipartisanship and also then real over partisan activity. So quantitatively, if you look at um, you know regular legislation versus repeals or, or non-appeal legislation versus repeal legislation, you know, and you look at the vote percent, you know, the vote breakdowns, you know, you say it's bipartisan for normal bills. That makes sense, you know, if you can get through the Congress. But repeals, you know, how bad is it in terms of partisanship? You know, are, are repeals ninety percent? same party, 100% same party in most cases over time? Or how does that work? What, what does it look when you actually break it down? Yo, no, you, what, what you offered is exactly right, is that um, you, most of the time with new legislation, um, non-repeal legislation, what you get is uh, the majority of the majority party will, of course, vote for it. Um, otherwise, the speaker wouldn't bring it to the floor. Um, but then uh, the minority party will often just kind of vote their district, right? So if the district would like this bill, then I'm going to vote with it. If the district is against it, then I'm not going to. Um, and so we do see, you know, it's, of course, not overwhelming margins on both sides voting in favor of something, but we do see pretty strong bipartisan relationships there. But with repeals, um, that's really where uh, I, I don't have data on whips. It'd be really interesting to get this, but like on pa the party whipping against uh, a bill, right, or whipping the party in favor of a bill, where we really do not see a lot of 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 minority party votes in favor of of that legislation. Um, and so, it, the, the the numbers really are very stilted. You know, ninety percent, ninety five percent kind of uh, uh, kind of party votes is is pretty standard. If the leaders know that. Right. If no, that's the case, that it's harder to pass then if, if it's a repeal versus, you know, some other way of achieving the same objective. It almost signals that they're not serious about the issue. Right. Because 
if they were serious about repealing Obamacare, then they would have taken a sneakier way to do it, right? Rather than, you know, make a big noise and try to repeal it and then ensure that they have the entire opposite party against them. Right. No, I think that's exactly right. There's a, there's a, the general kind of lack of, uh, of seriousness here really shows that we're not, we're not, and I'm not just talking about Obamacare here, but, but, you know, of course this includes Obamacare is it demonstrates a, a positioning for the, for, for somebody else, for an outside party. Um, for something that that way you can show, like again, that I did this in a public forum, rather than you know just uh, you know the you know we all have an employer mandate still, it's still on the books, but the, the penalty for that is zero, right? So we still have to take a box and on our IRS forms, but the uh, but the, the penalty for not having insurance is zero. That's that was that's a sneaky way of doing it, right? It's still on the books, but like you're never going to get in trouble with it. Um, but no, rather the idea is that we have to make this public we have to like like really stick a fork in the eye of the opponent is uh really indicates i think a lack of a lack of seriousness from a congressional approach but then also a lack of seriousness from constituents right to just simply say like like this is the only way that this can happen and then demanding that to be the case can you talk about what the subjects of the repeal are over long periods of time right so obamacare obviously is a is a recent one but and you mentioned you know the was it was it the metal was it yeah, gold I'm, standard versus silver or whatever you know back in the day so yeah. can you talk about what were the what were the uh the debates you know what were the big things that they that either people were serious or or ha- not really serious about repealing and has it yeah. changed the na- the nature of those issues the in general the, the things that are most ripe for repeal are economic or trade policies um those tend to be the most frequently revised anyway just simply because like, if we have a tax now that says we're going to tax you at 30 percent and then we pass a new policy that puts it at 20 percent, that means we have to repeal that legislation and, and put a new one in and so those do tend to be the kind of the most vulnerable um but the general framing of it is pretty consistent across you know 140 years where um it does tend to represent a partisan, again, as we talked about already, kind of a partisan fight. And so then we don't see a lot of repealing activity uh, when the parties are relatively harmonious, right? So, you know, in the 1950s, there was not a ton of repealing legislation simply because, you know, the, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party overlapped to a pretty high degree. Um, of course, not on civil rights, but they didn't talk about civil rights, so then that wasn't an issue. Um, but then as the party started to polarize, now there's a whole lot of, again, a whole lot of the other team's flags that we want to get to. And so the, the, the rhetoric is, with, with a few exceptions, but, but, the, but the, the, the broad strokes of the rhetoric really is consistent from the 1870s all the way till, till the present era, where it really is, again, negative partisanship, um, taking something away from them, and we're doing it for you, uh, the, the voter. Uh, and that tend, that tend yes, to- but, but the topics I'm curious about as well. So like in this case, it's it's health policy. Um, you know, in the past, you you mentioned the economic issues, you know, so it's, it's the, it was the standard gold standard, you know, is there any kind of commonality among all of these different things that are under the repeal banner versus things that aren't? Okay. Yeah. So, um, things that are talked about a lot that are temp- repeal attempts tend to be pretty broad. Um, you know, whether we're introducing a bill to repeal healthcare or civil rights or, uh, environmental policy, uh, repeal attempts tend to be pretty Pretty varied uh, in terms of the, the policies that, that we're going to try to talk about. And, and you can kind of see this is especially true when you're in the minority party, right? In the minority party, you're not allocating any scarce time for this. You're not, you're not, you're not having to kind of develop a coalition. So you're just simply just like just a lot, a lot, a lot of repeal uh, uh, legislation introduced. Most of it never goes anywhere. And, and that, again, is kind of your symbolic position taking approach, right? Saying like, I'm doing my best. Um, but, you know, it's those, it's, it's those dang sort of majority party that's there. And um, you need to vote them out so then I can actually get my way. Um, and so we see that pretty broad, but then the, the repeal policies that do actually tend to pass um, is a much, much, much smaller subset. And, um, you know, the, but the, when that does occur, we are going to see that again on uh, typically those economic or trade policies. We don't tend to see repeals on, say, uh, uh, civil rights legislation. Um, we don't tend to see things on people actually uh, kind of feel that are easy to understand and can get kind of animated about. So, you know, Obamacare was on un, was unpopular until uh, the Republican Party tried to take it away, and then people were like, oh, hey, like it's really nice to be able to keep my like twenty four year old on my health insurance, um, and so like don't threaten that. And so we do, do tend to see um, when, once the policy has been in place, once people tend, tend to begin to kind of benefit from it, 
um, then that's where that's where all of a sudden now it becomes a lot more solid and a lot more durable. Right. Excellent. So maybe we can talk about, I know in general, you've had some thoughts about legislatures and how they interact with executives, uh, the executive branches at the at the state level, maybe also the national. Can you talk through a little bit about what you're doing in that area, what questions you've had and what you found? Yeah, um, the one of the one of the things that's been very interesting to me, uh, just in general, is the relationship between executives and, and legislatures, and and how you know executive preferences can get built into a in, into into legislation. Um, you know, we know that we know that vetoes are sort of the, the governor's or the legis- or the president's primary way of of influencing things, but there's a lot more a lot more uh, kind of to it than just simply just using vetoes or uh, executive orders or things like that, and so. That's been a broad interest of mine. One of the kind of the ways that I've tried to get at that is looking at the relationship between governors and legislatures on COVID policy. Um, in general, what we should expect is that uh, whenever the governor is doing something, striking out uh, sort of to start, whether it's uh, you know Obama extending uh, doing DACA and, and delaying importation for uh, export, uh, uh, allowing childhood arrivals to stick around. Um, they're stepping into a space and trying to position something so that way it's like it it's more than what congress may want to do but congress doesn't have the capacity to, to then overturn it um and so the, the, we call this kind of preemption right where the governor is going to try to push the legislature just far enough right where the, i get my way and you may not like it but then you don't have the coalition the, the capacity then to to re- revise it to repeal it um and so the idea is really kind of how do how well as a governor am i going to be able to kind of uh, locate this with COVID, we did see that governors across the country were, except, except for Christy Noem, uh, did something about COVID. Uh, they all, even even, um, even Ron DeSantis, Kayati, very conservative governors still introduced COVID policies. They still introduced like uh, maybe suggested stay at home orders or real state home orders, uh, public masking, all kinds of restrictions. But they were systematically related to the, the, the legislature. Um, the, the more liberal the legislature was, the more restrictive the COVID policies were. The more conservative the legislature was, the more conservative the COVID policies were, the kind of less restrictive they were. Um, and that makes sense, right? That does kind of follow that traditional logic that I was talking about. All right. So well, regardless oh, of sorry. how conservative the governor was. That's right. The yeah, governor's, so. governor's uh, conservatism was irrelevant in what his policies, his or her policies were. It actually was just what they could get away with as it related to the legislature, which was determined by how liberal the legislature was. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you can look at, um, say, uh, 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 DeWine in Ohio and Bashir in Kentucky. You know, Bashir is a far more liberal person than DeWine is, but they have very similar policies um, because, in general, like the, you know, A, they're dealing with the same kind of, you know, Kentucky, Ohio areas, very, very, a lot of crossover. But then also the fact that, like, the legislatures themselves are very similar, right? And so, and you can kind of see that same kind of trajectory uh, across the country. That's fascinating. Um... Why, why you would think that the governors would follow more of their own, you know, personal views versus maximize. It, it basically, it's they're maximizing their power as as much as they can get away with. They're going to do it. it. It seems to be the conclusion. Yeah, that, that was it, it was it was that that's right. It was a, a strategic calculus. Right? I think Laura Kelly, the governor here in Kansas, would have liked things to be a lot more restrictive. Um, she would have liked to really really ratchet things down. Um, but she knew that the legislature was not going to not going to play ball with that. And so then she just pushed them as far as she could rather than as far as she wanted to go. Um, and despite that, despite her strategic calculus, the legislature still undid nearly all of her all, all of her policies. Um, and what we saw here in Kansas was not unique. Um, it, the, the Andrew Cuomo in uh in New York, he pushed way beyond what the legislature wanted, right? And then as a consequence, even though it was the same, even though it was all his unified government, he saw his his policies get 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 reversed. Um, whereas Gavin Newsom had a much more liberal legislature and was able to to pass pretty pretty restrictive policies, but that wasn't really a problem with them. Um, and so there was this kind of interesting relationship between how much the governor miscalculates um, and pushes farther than than they should. But then also, even if the governor calculates properly, we still see a lot of uh, a lot of reversals, despite the fact that the governor kind of put things where they they should be in terms of uh, sort of sensitivity to the legislature. Was this a universal rule, or were there any kind of outliers? It, it was a pretty universal trend. Um, there were there's some um, in Hawaii, for example, um, 
sorry. Um, uh, in Hawaii, for example, um, we saw some some reversals of policy, but they tended to be relatively minor, relatively symbolic. Hey, the governor should consult with us um, on a more regular basis. Um, what was more interesting, and this is pretty common, a lot of states uh, started to take back the power for the governor to pass any sort of emergency uh, uh, state of emergency, um, meaning that the governor can pass a state of emergency on anything, not just public health crisis, but wildfires, tornadoes, any kind of natural disaster, terrorist attack, um, now would require a consultation with the legislature, um, which is fundamentally undermining the idea of a unitary executive um, and really just kind of really kind of questioning uh, exactly what the proper role of, of, of an executive is, but the proper role of a legislature is. So, you know, it's interesting that... Um... When you think about this on a national level and the Congress and the U.S. president, right, um, it makes you wonder about dele- you know, allowing the, the executive more and more leeway. Um, however much leeway you give the executive, they're going to take all and potentially yeah. more. Yeah, that's I mean, that's absolutely right. One of my favorite things to talk about is uh, is kind of is war powers, and you know, the you know after after a whole lot of you know whether it was Truman getting us into the Korean War or LBJ escalating uh, the war in Vietnam, and then of course um, and of course Richard Nixon um, bombing Cambodia, right? We saw you know the Congress did pass the the War Powers Act, but that, that says you know you can you can deploy troops for sixty to ninety days, but after that then you need to take them home. That didn't bother Obama when he was supporting the Libyan uh, rebels. Um, we, we we supported them for nine months, um, all in clear violation of the War Powers Act. But Congress didn't didn't vote to actually uh, withdraw funds to withhold funds for for the troops uh, and for the engagement. And so we continued to uh, you know just launch missiles and, and enforce a no fly zone, uh, costing the taxpayers like just like thousands of dollars, right? And and all the while, um, clearly in violation, but no but no problem. <laughs> Because Congress didn't have the capacity to, uh, to 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 pull it back. So, what about in the states? Did that similar thing happen in COVID, where you had certain legislatures that were weaker than others and had a difficult time enforcing its will on the executive? You know, they're more dysfunctional, or they were more that they have some kind of structural, uh, we, you know, some rule or structural weakness that makes them weaker compared to the executive. And, and that gave the executive more power to just do whatever they wanted. Yeah, that's a good question. In normal circumstances, yes, right? In no, like, you know, the easiest way to kind of tell how powerful a state legislature is, is just how many staff do legislators have? How often are they in session? Um, are they paid, uh, right? Um, all of the, like the kind of basic ideas about, um, how professionalized your legislature is? How, how much how much power do you have as an individual legislator, or, or how much are you dependent on just party leadership, right? Because if you don't have staff, if you're not paid, uh, you have to also keep a second job. Then that just means you just don't have the same time to invest in learning about a policy, about kind of trying to differentiate differentiate yourself from the party uh, and do what your constituents want. And so in general, when we see policymaking uh, negotiations going on, the less professionalized the legislature is, the more the governor has leeway, the more it's sort of, the more opportunities the governor has to push in all kinds of different directions. What was unique with COVID is that that didn't matter. Um, California is the most professionalized legislature. Um, they allowed Newsom stuff to go through. Uh, Kansas is a very unprofessionalized legislature. And here we saw a, a lot of reversals on 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 the policies, and so in this one circumstance, uh, it seemed like professionalization, uh, which is again the thing that we look for, didn't matter. That's fascinating. Excellent. Well, any um, any other thoughts on this or or the repeal issue or the constituents before we move on to the second phase of the discussion? Um, not really. I would just uh, one thing I would just kind of note is just how unique this 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 kind of moment is in, in 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 politics is that we saw not just a very narrow rescission of a governor's covid policies uh, but we saw a broad rescission of the governor's powers writ large and so again what that means is that we're now entering this new world where uh the governor's powers to again do the things that we typically expect the governor to do to be the the, the decisive response responder to a state of emergency uh, now it's been weakened, and that's going to have a lot of spillover effects when, you know, as climate change continues to make natural disasters more and more prominent. Um, it'll be interesting to see exactly how how, how sort of the government, broadly defined, uh, is able to kind of coordinate responses. Interesting. 
Uh, well, it's time for us to move then on to the next phase of the discussion. We're going to ask you questions I've asked everybody else so we can compare the answers. Uh, the oh, first one I think uh, should be of particular interest to you is what do you think congressional representation should mean? And this is like, you know, are you the trustee of the delegate model? Are you the um, make judgments, you know, and, and what, and who are the constituents, you know, is it the primary voters? Is it everybody? Is it future generations? You know, how would you define the constituency? Uh, yeah, I like this a lot. Um, yeah. So in general, I, 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 in classic political scientist brain, I think about things kind of at two different levels. Um, one is of course the, just the relationship between a legislator and their constituents. And here, when I think about constituents, I, you know, in, in sort of differentiation with the rest of the literature, I think of constituents as the people who live in your district, right? Just like not your voters, not all voters, um, you know, the kind of Fenno's concentric circles, right? We're talking about the biggest concentric circle. Um, I like the idea of considering future generations as well, but that but I can't quite scale that right now. So, but, but the idea is, yeah, your geographic constituency, I think, is kind of the best way to understand uh, uh, constituents, uh, partially because of, you know, voting rights access, um, you know, felons, you know, people who are maybe, maybe, uh, affected by your policies, even if they can't vote because they're not naturalized citizens. I think all of those things should scale into the sense of, of the constituency. Um, and so in general, I would like to see good correspondence between the district, the, the district's preferences and the legislator's preferences. Um, I think that that's, that's an important kind of aspect there. And so, that sometimes though it comes at the expense of collective representation. How, you know, if 65, 70% of the country wants policy in this particular direction, but because the districts are are drawn in such a way, the you know, the the sort of the way that the micro doesn't necessarily match the macro can lead to a perversion where we get very little policy in in issues that people think are important. And I think that that's we do we do a pretty good relationship in that dyadic of representation between constituents and, and elected officials, particularly if you think about just voters. Um, but we do a bad job at that collective representation. And I think that that's important. Um, and you know, the output of Congress should broadly reflect the goals of, of, of the American public. And we don't always see that. And I think that that's, that's, that's a, a long-term problem that, that we need to wrestle with. So what about this notion of the, you alluded to it earlier, where you think that the legislator should uh represent the view or i should say uh is in line or whatever with the with the with the preferences of of the constituents right so that to me sounds like you know the the member is more like a window into the into the preferences of his electorate rather than making judgments on what he or she may think is in the best interest of their constituents so you're more of a um i, I forgot which model it's called but the uh it's a little bit more delegate than trustee. Yeah, delegate uh, than trustee, right? So you're you're on the delegate side of things rather than the trustee side. I tend I tend to be, um, but at the same time, also again, like we we can look at California. Um, people hold unsophisticated policy preferences, right? Like we want to both increase education funding and then also cut taxes, um, and so um, that's cool. But like, where's that money going to come from? And so um, there is. I, I, I am sympathetic to the kind of a slightly more Burkean approach that kind of the more trustee approach when it comes to assembling all of these different uh, disparate preferences, right? Okay, we want, cut, we want to cut taxes, we want to increase education spending. Um, how do we achieve both? Uh, I think that that's the, sort of the, the, the goal of a good representative is the ability to still follow what, what the constituents want, but, but then ultimately uh, still use their expertise to, to direct it in a way that makes sense and is coherent rather than just, again, sort of California doing just a whole bunch of different policies that don't really add up together. And so how does that square with your notion of the future, right? Because you can imagine a situation in which, um, you know, the preferences of the constituents right now is to give themselves all some candy at the expense of the future generation, uh, that the future generation can pay for it, right? Yep. So, you know, is that something that, is that a is that a problem you see, or or do you think that the current constituents somehow embody those future generations' needs? Uh, <laughs> I think it is very important that again, sort of the policymakers in their positions uh, are able to be a little bit more forward thinking, right? So, you know, I think that at base level, uh, constituents, I mean, we all are kind of you know animalistic, right? We care about you know getting more of ours, right, and and kind of protecting it. And it'd be very nice if we weren't, right? It'd be very nice if we were much more forward thinking. 
um, as, just as just as people, um, but we don't tend to have that ability. It's just it's kind of hardwired for us. And so it'd be very nice if our legislators were we're, we're taking that time to to not just have a short term goal, but a long term goal as well, and making sure that the short term goal can help us achieve the long term goal. Um, I do think that's a real problem. Um, you know, we can look at the just any number of things from. I'm not one of those who thinks the national debt is an existential crisis the same way that others do. Um, but I also do know that it's something we need to wrestle with. Um, Social Security, Medicare, like those things are going to be massively uh, painful for the country in the next 20 years as, as the popu- as the baby boomers, you know, a, a fully age into retirement. And we don't have the same size population working now to support those support those programs. And so th- we need to figure out a way to to, to take care of people who bought into a particular system, but we also need to think of a way to take care of the people now, right? And so, and that is, I think it's one of the biggest problems that we're gonna face is uh, is, is the ability to, to protect uh, the current interests and also, but also future ones as well. Yeah, and that the challenge with that is it argues a little bit more for this trustee model yep. versus the delegate model. Cause you have to, if, if current constituents don't really think about future generations, if they're not embodying those future needs, then, uh, then nobody does, right. The only, the representative, uh, has that, has that responsibility to look forward under the, under the, the, um, the trustee model. So that's, yeah. a, that's, a, it's a challenge. It is. And because the other challenge, of course, is that we don't vote based on the trustee model, right? We vote, we, we vote based on the delegate model, right? It's not about, hey, this is a really good plan for 20 years, um, but it's going to hurt me right now. I'm going to vote you out. Um, and so as a consequence, um, even if a legislator, I would like legislators to adopt a slightly, you know, that my, my kind of idea of a modified delegate, um, like we are not sophisticated enough as voters um, to, to, to really kind of buy into that long-term thinking. And so then uh, so as a consequence, even, even the good legislators get voted out. So, right. It's, it's not the problem of the voter necessarily. It's the pro- problem of the representative who wants to get reelected. Yep. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's always short-term thinking. Um, you know, what's going what, what's going to work for me. Uh, and even if you're a Senator, you got six years, um, you can still see a, a, a real electoral tether. Um, you know, Jeremy Moran spoke some years ago about giving Merrick Garland a hearing, right? So this is back um, back under the Obama administration still. He said that, yeah, we should give Merrick Garland a hearing. We should just do our job. And uh, immediately, a uh, pr- primary challenger followed, uh, uh, sort of uh, filed to run, and Moran kind of walked that back. Um, and and so even though he was a senator, very, very popular here, um, still found himself uh, looking, looking over his shoulder to see what the primary voters were going to do. Right. Right. Next question is, you know, how would your ideal Congress allocate its time, you know, in terms of D.C. versus the home district, um, dialing for dollars versus legislating? You know, how would you if you could dictate their their schedules, how would you do yeah. it? Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, this, this is a collective action problem. Right. But if I can dictate it for everybody, then it's not a problem. Right. Because like, you know, what, what I absolutely want is. Man, your job is to legislate. Um, your job is to develop policy expertise. Your job is to understand uh, the implementation of policy, how agencies are following through with these things. Um, your job is not just to, I, I think there is a role of going to, you know, all the counties in a state if you're a senator and, and making whistle stop tours. I think that that is important and it, sh- and it helps promote trust in government. But I think that that should not come at the expense of uh, of developing policy expertise, developing policy sophistication. Um, and so I would very much like to see the Tuesday, Thursday club uh, where you, you know, you fly in on Tuesday morning, Wednesday, Monday night, and then you're, you know, you, you can smell the jet fumes um, on, on Thursday afternoon. Uh, I'd very much like to see that done away with. Um, I'd like to see, you know, a couple sessions, a couple recesses where you can actually go back to the district and go make sure that people trust you, trust government, and that you're listening to them. Um, but the overwhelming majority of the time, you know, 80% of the time is in DC. It, it's developing a uh, sort of a, not having to outsource uh, policy expertise to interest groups, uh, but rather to really have it in-house um, and and also develop in those long-term relationships that allow you, um, even if they're the other party, to hey, we don't agree on a lot, but we do agree on this and, and actually make something happen with that. I'd very much like to see 80% of the time in policy expertise and, and the, the the work of, of legislating. And in terms of that breakdown, you know, do you see a difference between, you know, this, you know, legislation versus oversight work? Is that the same thing? And would you ban them from doing the dialing for dollars while they're in in D.C.? 
Um, I would have to think about the downstream consequences of, dialing, of not dialing for dollars, um, but in, but on sort of first blush, yeah, I'd like to see them just, yeah, no more dialing for dollars. Um, I'd very much like to see our campaign season shortened to, you know, six weeks <laughs> instead of, you know, like two years, two years at a clip. Um, uh, I, oversight is really critically important. Um, it's not something that we as voters tend to really care about. And so the members of Congress naturally will not do as much as they should. Um, and so there's there is an element of if you're there 80 percent of the time, then I do think a he healthy portion should be oversight. Um, you know, we think about the the FAA having to outsource all of its expertise to Boeing on this on those uh, the Supermax jets. And the FAA didn't have the capacity to, to monitor Boeing. Members of Congress certainly didn't have the capacity to monitor what the FAA was doing. Uh, and so we have a real lack of capacity from 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 st from start to finish, but that leads to bad policy consequences, right? And then it leads to planes going down, people dying, like, and then and then all kinds of planes being uh, just being mothballed for a while, and that's that's a that's a lack of governance, um, and from both at the agency level and at congressional level. Um, and I would very much like to see more oversight as well. Right. Well, the next question is, how should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? You know, should it be on the floor? Should it be in the committees? Should it be behind closed doors? Should it be open and transparent? Um, the, I'm actually not as as hugely influenced by transparency as other people are. Um, Justin Kirkland and uh, uh, Jeff Harden have some really good work that looks at how transparency doesn't really change policymaking. Uh, but what it does do is actually give interest groups uh, more ability to monitor uh, what uh, what is going on. And so it doesn't really change uh, the sort of the constituent to legislator behavior, but it does give interest groups uh, an additional leg up in their ability to influence uh, the policymaking process. Um, I do think, though, in general, um, I think there's kind of a, 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 a mishmash of, of best places for it to occur. I, I, I'm one of those who likes the idea of a congressional dorm. Um, I like that. I'm, I like the idea of uh, of solving the housing problem, right? Because it is it is simply ridiculous. These people do not get paid well enough to like maintain two houses, um, and so that's a, that's a problem. Um, but then we also, unless you're independently wealthy, which a lot of them are. Um, and so that does mean that there's going to be a lot of things that just simply happen, like on the racquetball court, or you know, like years ago, like Paul Ryan was having people do P90X, right? Like those things are those things are useful. Um, uh, committee hearings tend to be a lot of, especially when they're televised, tend to be a lot of one person saying the same thing the next one did, but this time they're doing it for their camera. Um, and so I would like to see uh, committee deliberations be a little bit more legitimate. Um, and the House floor or the Senate floor, I don't think there's a lot of by that point, the cake is largely in the oven. Um, and so then there's not a lot of chances for us to kind of um, uh, sort of change things. So I'd really like to see more deliberation of those kind of those antecedent steps before something comes to the floor. Got it. Next question is what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Uh, yeah, I'm going back to capacity on this one. I think that it's really about uh, undoing uh, what Newt Gingrich did in the Republican Revolution and just cutting permanent staff. I think that um, it's... It, there are a lot of other things that, that is wrong with Congress, but I think that the, the single biggest thing is a lack of staff, a lack of professional staff who uh, work on the committees, um, who can help support like CRS and Congressional Re uh, Research Service, sorry, and then all of these other all these other groups. Members of Congress can be forgiven for not being policy experts. Um, you know, uh, hopefully after you know one or two or three uh, uh, trips, you kind of figure things out. But you should be able to rely on uh, on, on good staff to help fill you in and make sure you understand the nuances of any given policy area. Uh, the fact that we don't have good professional staff means that, again, you're outsourcing that responsibility to interest groups. And they're not not—they're very often accurate, but they're, of course, not giving you the whole picture. And so I'm, I'm very, very persuaded by the idea that, you know, dramatically ramping up uh, staff, dramatically ramp and not just not, and, and specifically permanent staff that are subject matter experts. Um, I think that is one of the things that will dramatically change policymaking for the better. So you mean legislative staff versus communications staff, et cetera? Yeah, exactly. The, the members of Congress know what we want, right? And what we want in the short term is, of course, to to have information, right? To be to to have, uh, you know, to call and say, "Hey, my passport is not is not done. Can you look into that?" And that's an important role of government. But members of Congress are already good at that. Um, but that that's changes things at the micro level. But again, sophisticated policy and the ability to conduct meaningful oversight, the ability to, uh, to to write policy that has as few negative externalities, negative consequences as possible, 
that's something that we don't tend to vote on as 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 elect just as members of the electorate, but that's really critical for a healthy and and good well functioning government. Right. Next question is: What book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? Yeah, I, there's some really good stuff out um, recently by, with people like Tim Lapira um, and 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 Kevin Kosar and and others. Um, I think that for me, the the biggest book, the, the book that changed the way I thought about things the most was actually uh, Baumgartner and Jones's Politics of Information, um, which kind of actually speaks to my, uh, my my problem with the lack of professional staff is that, you know, as they point out, if members of Congress don't have the capacity to to look up information, right, then the, you know, there's fewer problems that we're aware of. There's fewer things that need policies to to solve those problems. And so then it's just dramatically uh, weakening the power that, that the government has. And so I think that um, that that was kind of a paradigm shift for me in the way I thought about Congress, the way I thought about the state legislatures as well. Um, it was really about about the access the members of Congress have to good information. And last question is really about your your plans for the future. What what research projects do you have uh, coming up, and what can we expect on uh, you know coming up on the horizon? Yeah, so um, right now, obviously, a couple things are under review. Now, there's the, the one on the co that COVID paper that we discussed quite a bit. The repeals and rhetoric paper is is, is working its way through the the process. Um, as I said, I've, one of the things I'm really excited about right now is this new project looking at the congressional response to shootings. Um, do members of Congress actually introduce legislation to improve mental health if they say that that's a critical thing? We know we know that Democrats do tend to respond to shootings and actually promote gun control legislation, uh, but it's really inter I'm interested to find out exactly how how Republicans and just people opposed to gun control, um, not just Republicans, but a few Democrats as well, how they respond. Um, after that, um, I don't have any. It's funny. I don't. I, I don't tend to have a really like six article kind of research agenda. Instead, it's, it's a little bit more about all of these different ideas about pulling data together. I'm always kind of coming back to some tools, right? It's like taking data from disparate source A, B, C, D, and m making them work together to and with that kind of toolkit, I just kind of sometimes inspiration just strikes when I'm on a run. Like we should look into this, and uh, so that's frankly just. Whatever I do next is going to have a lot of different data sources probably merged together um, in, the, in, the, in the pursuit of answering some questions that we haven't done before. Excellent. Professor Burkhead, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and best of luck in the coming work. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciated this.